Before we begin today's episode, just a reminder to like, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell if you enjoy this episode. On a cold January night in 1997, 28-year-old Robin Trevisano drove over to the bar where she used to work. Frustrated with her boyfriend and looking to let off some steam, she had a few drinks with friends and tried to brush it all off. A few hours later, she asked friends for a ride to a different bar, but no one could help. Just then, a mysterious man emerged and engaged her in conversation. No one knew who he was, but they all agreed he was well-dressed, well-groomed, tanned, and had a polished smile. No one seemed to notice that a few minutes later, Robin walked out with him. Neither of them have ever been seen again. The investigation was stilted from the start, an utter lack of evidence and no sure direction to search. Months would pass before evidence was discovered near the location Robin intended to go to, though no witnesses saw her there that night. Had Robin actually made it there? Or could someone have planted evidence to distract investigators from the truth? For more than two decades, Robin's family and police have tried to determine what may have happened to the mother of three that night. Where was she taken? And just who was this unidentified man who was last with her? This is Trace Evidence, Episode 145, The Disappearance of Robin Trevisano. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today we examine the truly mysterious disappearance of Robin Travisano. Before getting into the case, just a few notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. You can follow the show on social media on Twitter at TraceEvPod, Instagram at TraceEvidencePod, or by searching Facebook for Trace Evidence. The show is also on MeWe and Minds. If you're interested in supporting the show and getting some Trace Evidence merch, there's a Patreon available at patreon.com slash traceevidence, or you can donate via PayPal. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, donation options, and contact information. You can submit case suggestions there or directly email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. 28-year-old Robin Travisano was a devoted mother of three who was having a bad night that would only get worse. In the end, she never made it home. This is episode 145, The Disappearance of Robin Travisano. It was bitterly cold as the late night transitioned into very early morning in Neptune City, New Jersey. Frigid winds swept in from the Atlantic Ocean just a few miles to the east, keeping the temperature from rising out of the mid-teens, where it had been slowly dropping for the previous hours. While the majority of residents were keeping warm in their homes, many already tucked into bed as Sunday became Monday, some who had ventured out had a different idea of beating the winter chill. Their journey would lead them down Route 35 turning slowly into the parking lot of Heartbreakers, a bar which on this night offered warmth, drinks, and its main attraction, go-go dancers. While many found their way into the establishment late into the night and early morning hours, at least one woman was looking for the exit. 28-year-old Robin Trevisano, a former dancer at the bar, had been having a tough night. After an argument with her boyfriend, she'd come down to see a few friends, have some drinks, and let the stress roll off her back. However, now she was looking to take a trip out to another club nearby to visit a different friend, but she needed a ride. Having downed a few shots, Robin wasn't the type to get behind the wheel. None of her friends could help her out that night. They were either working or had been drinking themselves. That's when a mysterious figure came forward and offered his services. No one seemed to know who he was, but they would all later describe him the same. Extremely well-dressed, shoulder-length brown hair, 
blue eyes and brilliant white teeth. Robin, who by this time was beginning to feel the effects of her drinks, pulled on her waist-length brown coat and precariously maneuvered through the bar, following the mysterious man out from the heat into the brisk parking lot. What happened over the course of the next hours remains unknown, but Robin Trevisano never made it home. Robin Leake was born on June 27, 1968, to parents Mary and Robert in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. While Robin was born in Philly, she would spend her childhood growing up 20 miles across the state line in Pine Hill, New Jersey. Robin had a younger brother and two half-sisters growing up. The youngster showed athletic skill from an early age, with her mother telling the Asbury Park Press that she was very much a tomboy throughout her youth. Sadly, in 1980, when Robin was just 12 years old, her father passed away at the young age of 39 after a battle with cancer. While there is no way of knowing for sure, this may have influenced her desire to become a nurse later in life. Tragedy would strike again just five years later, on May 13, 1985. One of Robin's half-sisters, Teresa Brooks Africa, was killed during the infamous Philadelphia Move bombing. In the aftermath, 11 people died and more than 60 homes were destroyed by fire. It is truly one of America's darkest moments, and there are several thorough and in-depth documentaries available which detail each terrifying moment. Enduring through the grief of losing a child in such a horrible way, Mary grew closer to her youngest daughter. Robin worked hard while attending Overbrook High School. She continued to expand on her athleticism, focusing in more sharply on her chosen sport, baseball, where she would go on to make the all-star team. Beyond baseball, Robin would also become a cheerleader, especially enjoying her time on the sidelines of football games. Growing up in New Jersey, one might imagine she'd focus on teams such as the Giants or Jets, but Robin was a diehard fan of the Dallas Cowboys, and much to her family's chagrin, dared to wear the navy and silver jersey into Veterans Stadium, where the Eagles played prior to opening Lincoln Financial Field. Following her high school graduation, Robin began pursuing her studies, working towards the goal of becoming a nurse. In order to help support her college education, she picked up a job working as a waitress in nearby Atlantic City. This would prove to be a fateful choice where, at the age of 19, she met and fell in love with Robert Trevisano. After dating for a year and a half, Robin and Robert married on June 19, 1988, aboard the Spirit of Philadelphia as it cruised the Delaware River. Mary later told the Asbury Park Press, quote, Robin was so happy, it was a glorious day, end quote. Following their nuptials, the newlyweds moved into a home in Absicon, a suburb of Atlantic City some 40 miles east of Robin's hometown. In the beginning, the couple was happy, and that joy was expanded on with the eventual arrival of their first son. Two years later, he was followed by a pair of twin boys. Robin was ecstatic to be a mother, though the swift arrival of her new family had put her college plans on hold for the time. Unfortunately, in the years that passed, financial issues mounted and the couple struggled to keep things together. In 1993, they were separated and ultimately divorced the following year. While the divorce was not contentious or heated, both had acknowledged that the relationship couldn't be saved. Mary would describe the split, saying, quote, They got married in a bang, and they got divorced in a bang. End quote. As a 26-year-old single mother of three sharing custody, Robin struggled to make it on her own. Her dream of finishing college and getting her nursing degree still lingered, but it was a question of how she'd managed to do that while keeping a home and supporting her children. As a result of the divorce, Robert was required to pay child support payments in the amount of $150 a week, but without a solid, good-paying job, Robin was often left struggling to make it. She eventually moved into a two-story duplex on North Roseboro Avenue in Ventnor City, 15 miles from the home she shared with Robert, and a 10-minute stroll from the boardwalk. 
Despite the financial challenges she faced, Robin was a devoted mother who adored her children and described them as being her entire life. The walls of her home were covered in photographs of her and the boys. When she could, she'd take them out on adventures such as camping trips. Her sister, Veronica Dodson, described Robin as a vigilant parent to the Philadelphia Inquirer. She was a fun mom, but she had her rules. No snacks after 8 p.m., and generally no cookies or candy, but fruit and crackers. Bedtime was 9 p.m. on school nights, and any attempt at negotiating would end in a victory for the young mother. Mary tried to lend a hand as best she could, offering her daughter a place to live, but Robin was stubbornly focused on taking care of herself and the boys. It was some months after the divorce in mid-94 that one of Robin's friends picked up an audition to work as a go-go dancer and advised her that she could easily make enough money to support the kids and go back to school just by dancing a few nights a week. Robin wasn't exactly excited by the proposition, but she agreed to go along for the audition. It wasn't the dancing that drew her attention, but how much money could be made over a short amount of time, and ultimately, she decided to give it a shot. Mary wasn't pleased with the choice, trying to convince her that there were other options, but Robin's mind was made up. Mary later detailed the conversation to the Asbury Park Press, saying, quote, She said, Mom, right now, all I have is $18.50 in my pocket. That's not going to feed me and my kids. These dancers make good money, and I'm not going to be a burden to you. End quote. Michael Landy, the owner of Heartbreakers, stated that Robin showed up one day to audition and he hired her on the spot. Robin never fully came around to accept what she was doing, seeing it more as a means to an end, but she did have to confront some misconceptions about the job. People frequently use the term go-go dancer interchangeably with stripper, and while there are similarities, there are also differences. Loriana, in an article for Thought Catalog, explained the three primary differences as, quote, one, we don't strip. Two, we work at nightclubs, not strip clubs. Three, we don't strip. End quote. Robin would don an assortment of revealing outfits for work, but there was no touching and no nudity. In fact, New Jersey has a law in the books that explicitly states no business that offers erotic dancing and nudity can possess a liquor license. Some businesses find their way around it, allowing customers to bring in their own drinks. But Heartbreakers was primarily a bar and club, and so go-go dancing was their best option. Robin also went to great lengths to conceal her job, choosing to work out of Heartbreakers in Neptune City, 80 miles north of her home. She also took on a pseudonym, calling herself Tony when she was dancing. Beyond that, the only person in her life that knew what she was doing was her mother, who was sworn to secrecy. Robin wanted to keep that world as far away from her children as possible, and with the combination of distance and a fake name, she figured it was unlikely anyone in her life would find out. While many women who have go-go danced have reported feeling embarrassed or ashamed at the beginning, Many also say their confidence and comfort with the job grew over time. This did not appear to be the case for Robin, as Mary told the Philadelphia Inquirer, quote, She hated dancing. She hated it with a passion. End quote. Mary went on to explain that Robin would sometimes have a few drinks to get over the discomfort and embarrassment she felt when she was at work. While she always came home during the week she had the kids, on the off times, she would occasionally stay over with a friend. On those rare nights when she wouldn't be home, she would always call and let her mother know. While it surely wasn't the job she wanted, the money came in much more quickly than it had working other jobs and dramatically eased the financial pressure she'd been feeling. While go-go dancing afforded her the ability to support her kids, it would also introduce a major complication to her life. Robin continued working at Heartbreakers for nearly two years when a new man came into her life. There isn't a lot of information available about this man. Even his name has been kept from the public by both police and Robin's family. But what details are known reveal that Robin and her partner 
may have had very different expectations. Robin's boyfriend, a New Jersey-based lawyer, apparently met her while she was working at the club, and the two hit it off. One crucial detail, which later emerged in interviews with police and Robin's mother, was that the boyfriend had a wife. Whether or not Robin knew this from the beginning or found out later has never been confirmed in one way or another. What we do know is that after she became aware, the relationship continued. The boyfriend reportedly wasn't happy with Robin continuing to dance for a living and tried to talk her out of it, but Robin needed the money for school and her kids. At some point, the boyfriend explained that he could pay for her schooling and support her financially if she were to quit, and that's exactly what she did. While Mary was happy that her daughter was no longer dancing, she wasn't thrilled with the idea of her dating a married man. Seemingly, Robin had it in her head that this guy was going to leave his wife for her, but Mary saw it differently. As she later told the Asbury Park Press, quote, I told her, Robin, don't think he's going to marry you. He'll have a thousand just like you after he's dumped you, end quote. Mary once again tried to convince her daughter to move in with her, leaving behind both the dancing and the married boyfriend, but Robin wouldn't budge. The relationship continued on through the rest of 96, with Robin now 28 years old. That same year, Robin enrolled in the nursing program at Atlantic Cape Community College and finally resumed the pursuit of her dream. While not many details of her relationship with the lawyer are known, it seems to have been a highly complicated situation where he was supporting her while continuing on with his marriage. But the longer things went on, the more Robin began adding pressure for him to leave his wife and be with her. This wasn't in the cards, at least from his perspective. Whether or not he made empty promises or platitudes to keep her with him, we have no way of knowing. But according to Mary, in the months leading up to her disappearance, Robin had been drinking more than usual, suggesting that she was feeling stressed out and possibly somewhat depressed at her situation. No matter what was going on in her life, though, Robin made every effort to present her children with a happy, loving home environment, and by all accounts, she was exceedingly successful at this. Aside from nursing being a dream she'd harbored for years, it would also give her the ability to achieve financial independence, to be able to support her family on her own, as she had always wanted. The exchange of go-go dancing for a married boyfriend may have been more of a lesser of two evils situation, but with emotions tied into it, there's no rational way of knowing what exactly the decisions were that were being made. By the end of 96, though, the situation remained the same. Robin's ex-husband, Robert, was going to be picking the boys up on Friday, January 17th, to have them for the weekend. Since Monday, the 20th, was Martin Luther King Day, school would be closed, and he'd have the children for an additional day, with them set to return to Robin after school on Tuesday the 21st. According to everything we know, Robin's weekend began as normally as could be expected. She spent most of her time at home with her face buried in her textbooks. Being that she was alone for most of the weekend, there's no way of knowing exactly what her plans were. But on Sunday the 19th, we know she was planning to see her boyfriend. According to the official timeline, Robin made the 80-mile trip north from her Ventnor City home into Monmouth County to meet her boyfriend at his office. According to Mary and investigators, after speaking with the boyfriend, they were able to confirm that Robin spent approximately two hours with him. At some point during their time together, Robin became angry and upset. It was later reported by multiple sources that the boyfriend directly told investigators that Robin had, once again, broached the subject of him leaving his wife, at which time he explained to her that he had no plans to do so. Angry and frustrated, Robin decided she wanted to spend some time with a few friendly faces and knock back a couple of drinks, and this led her on to Route 35, where she pulled her black Jeep Cherokee into the parking lot of her old job, Heartbreakers where it would be found two days later. Police have stated Robin got to Heartbreakers at approximately 9.30, and knowing that time allows us to work backwards, 
estimating that she left her boyfriend's office sometime between 8.45 and 9. Since they had spent around two hours together, this would have her arriving in Monmouth County sometime between 6.30 and 7. Considering the hour-long drive from her house, it's estimated she left sometime between 5.30 and 6 p.m. When Robin arrived at the bar, it was reportedly a busy night with a lot of people coming and going. While at the bar, Robin had a few drinks and chatted with several friends and former co-workers. Alton Butch Anderson, then employed as a DJ at the bar, remembered speaking with her for a period of time. Anderson told the Asbury Park Press, quote, She was telling me about her nursing, about how she wanted to be a nurse. She was drinking tequila when she bought me a shot of Applejack, end quote. After spending approximately three hours at the bar, it's been reported by multiple witnesses that Robin began asking around for a ride to another location, Delilah's Den, where she wanted to visit a friend who was working there as a DJ. Delilah's Den was located in South Amboy, approximately 25 miles to the northwest. According to witness statements, none of Robin's friends could give her a ride, either because they were working or they'd been drinking. By this point in the night, several people noted that Robin appeared to be noticeably intoxicated. At approximately 12.30 a.m., a bartender saw Robin making her way towards the door, seemingly in the company of a yet unidentified man. This was the last time anyone saw Robin other than the person who was responsible for the mother of three never getting home to her boys. When Heartbreakers closed that night, several employees, including Michael Landy, noticed Robin's Jeep still sitting in the parking lot. Landy noted to the Asbury Park Press, quote, that was unusual, but we thought she had gotten a ride home, end quote. Monday, January 20th, would come and go, with no one noticing that Robin had never made it home. Her three boys, who normally would have arrived after school, were still with their father due to the three-day weekend. No one would know anything was wrong until the kids arrived at her home after school on Tuesday the 21st. By that time, it had been more than 35 hours since anyone had seen Robin. It was extremely unusual for Robin to be gone when the boys arrived, and this led them to notifying their grandmother, Mary, that their mom wasn't home. Immediately, Mary was concerned, telling the Courier News, quote, I knew right then that something awful happened to her, because no matter what, she was always home for her boys, end quote. Entering Robin's home, Mary quickly took a look around. While there was nothing obviously out of place, no indications of a break-in, a struggle, or any crime, it was the stillness and the way things were left that sent a chill down her spine. On the kitchen table sat open a textbook, Anatomy and Physiology. Beside the textbook was a notebook with a pencil on top. It looked as though Robin had simply left home spur of the moment, maybe to run an errand, but she never would have failed to be home for her boys. Frightened and concerned, Mary began placing calls anywhere she could think to, trying to track down her daughter. When she called Heartbreakers, she learned Robin had been there, but while she had left, her Jeep was still sitting in the parking lot, where it had been since Sunday night. Mary quickly notified police, and their investigation launched within hours of her children finding the home empty. It didn't take long to determine that Heartbreakers was the last place Robin had been seen, so investigators from the Neptune Police Department arrived to question employees who had been present Sunday night into Monday morning. While no one knew where Robin was, multiple people were able to describe the man she was seen leaving with. He was Caucasian, 5'8 to 5'9, weighing between 170 and 180 pounds. His eyes were light either blue or gray, and his hair was light brown, shoulder-length, and well-groomed. Everyone commented about his teeth, describing them as nice, clean, and bright white. He had a tan, which one person described as looking as though he'd just returned from vacation. He was well-dressed, wearing a dark-colored suit, white shirt, and dark tie. 
Several witnesses stated that the man was wearing both a gold bracelet and gold ring. He was believed to be in his 30s. None of the employees knew the man's identity. He wasn't a regular, nor had they seen him arrive in the company of anyone they knew. Mary was somewhat unconvinced, later telling the Courier News, quote, I think they do know something. I think they're protecting someone, end quote. Everyone present that night, however, spoke with investigators and told them everything they knew. Owner Mike Landy expressed his own frustration, saying, quote, I have kids myself. Believe me, anything we know, we told the police, end quote. Unfortunately, it wasn't much to go on. And even though Robin had been seen with the unknown man, no one reported her seeming distressed or concerned. Neptune Police Detective Captain Angelo Diglio later told the Philadelphia Inquirer, quote, As of this time, we do not have any physical proof that there is something wrong, but we know that it doesn't look good. End quote. Police began to consider the possibility that Robin may have run off, but everyone in her life shot that down quickly. Friends, family, and former co-workers all noted how dedicated she was to her children, and there was no chance she would have left without notifying them, or anyone else for that matter. Being that Heartbreakers was the last spot Robin had been seen, police launched a search of a wooded area behind the bar, but nothing of significance was found, with investigators noting that while they didn't believe there was anything there, it was basic procedure to check that location. After completing interviews with Heartbreakers employees, investigators had a few different directions to look. Primarily, they wanted to speak to Robin's boyfriend to find out what exactly had transpired between them the night she vanished. In addition, detectives were sent to Delilah's den as multiple witnesses said they heard Robin was looking to go there when she left the bar that night. They also had witnesses sit down with a sketch artist to construct both a composite of the unidentified man and what Robin looked like the night she disappeared. Detectives were also interested in speaking to Robert, though he had a solid alibi for his whereabouts that night and expressed genuine concern for Robin. He was quickly ruled out. Interviews at Delilah's Den failed to turn up any leads. No one at the club had seen Robin the night she disappeared, leading investigators to wonder whether or not she'd even made it that far. Another dead end, or so it seemed. Upon completion of the composite sketches, police were quick to issue them to the press, though they also noted that they wanted to speak with the man he was not at the time considered a suspect. It was their hope that circulating the image might result in a name, or even perhaps someone who would see him what kind of vehicle he was driving. Several tips came in, and police conducted multiple interviews, though none of the men they spoke with turned out to be the man from the sketch. Speaking with Robin's boyfriend, whose name authorities chose not to release, investigators were able to get a better picture of Robin's state of mind that night, though they didn't learn anything which got them further along in the case. It was discovered that on Sunday the 19th, her boyfriend had left a message for her explaining that the weather was very bad and maybe she shouldn't come to his office. Whether or not Robin received that message or had already left her home was not known for sure. If an exact time is known for when that message was left, police have never released that information. Unfortunately, the case began growing cold almost immediately. Investigators had no solid evidence of a crime, no crime scene to examine, no knowledge of where Robin may have been taken or what her fate might be. While both investigators and the family tried to remain positive, the possibilities were quickly turning grim. Robin's sister, Veronica, explained to the Philadelphia Inquirer, quote, If Robin was anywhere halfway conscious, she would have found a way to reach us. End quote. Mary wanted to hope for the best, but something in her gut was telling her that this wasn't going to have a happy ending. Trying to express her feelings, Mary told reporters, quote, As a mother, I want her to be out there, to be alive. But realistically, it doesn't look that way. Not knowing is just agony. It's your worst nightmare come true. End quote. Robin's family held a vigil of sorts, 
gathering at her home and trying to raise their spirits and attention about her case. While with each passing day, the likelihood of Robin being found alive shrank a little more, there was still hope that there would be a breakthrough. Sadly, though, time began passing with no new leads, no developments, and with investigators operating off a nearly blank slate. Mary moved into her daughter's home, wanting to feel close to her, but when her twin boys' birthdays came and went, without word from Robin, she began to accept the tragic reality. By the end of February, the family began packing up Robin's belongings and ultimately closed her home, with Mary explaining, quote, I don't think Robin is alive. If she was alive, she wouldn't have missed a minute of their day, never mind a birthday party. End quote. Mary struggled to leave the home for the last time, feeling that she was somehow abandoning her daughter in doing so. In hopes of helping the boys to process the situation, their father began sending them to weekly sessions with a therapist. In the absence of new information, police did the best they could. They checked on every Jane Doe found in the months following Robin's disappearance and brought tracking dogs out to heartbreakers in hopes of finding her scent, but nothing was located. Four long months would pass before investigators received any new evidence in this case, and when they did, it was not where they would have expected it to be. In late May or early June, I can't give you an exact date because not a single source notes one, two items were discovered in a wooded area behind Delilah's den in South Amboy the very place Robin had been trying to get a ride to the night she disappeared. The items were the jacket she was wearing that night and her purse. While not many details have been revealed about this discovery, including who found them, it's been noted that $500 cash was still in Robin's purse when it was recovered. This new evidence led to a string of considerations. Had Robin actually made it to the club that night? but something happened in the parking lot before she could get in. Also, many wondered, had the items been in that location for the entire four months, or had someone placed them there at a later time? Neither of those questions have solid answers, though while no witnesses saw Robin at Delilah's that night, it has been said that there's also no evidence to say that she didn't at least get to the parking lot. Unfortunately, while this new evidence helped reignite the investigation, it never led to any major developments. In fact, Robin's case has been essentially ice cold since nearly the very moment she was reported missing. As the years began passing, police acknowledged they were investigating Robin's case as a homicide, though they still lacked any solid evidence of what may have happened that cold January night. Their focus turned towards Jane Doe's specifically those found in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and Virginia, and there were a few instances in which they believed they might have a candidate, though in every case they would fail to get a match. In what can only be described as a hauntingly sad coincidence, on the very night Robin vanished, a woman was struck and killed by a vehicle while walking along Route 280 in Kearney, New Jersey approximately 25 miles north of Delilah's Den, where Robin was heading the night she disappeared and where her purse and jacket were later found. Initially, many people believed this could be Robin. While multiple details of this particular Jane Doe do not match up with what is known about Robin, including hair color and length, fingernails, scars, ear piercings, and clothing, many people still believe that this could be Robin. According to NamUs, however, there has never been a DNA comparison issued between the two, likely due to the aforementioned differences and several others. Sadly, there are a lot of unidentified female victims out there, and putting just some of Robin's parameters into NamUs can result in as many as 200 possibilities, though the closer you look, the more reasons you find to disqualify them. I should also note, however, NamUs records indicate only one comparison has been conducted related to Robin on a Jane Doe found in Virginia in 2001. It was not a match. January 20th, 2021 marks 24 years since Robin disappeared. Over that time, many things have changed, 
and the places she once knew are no longer. The Delilah's Den location where her items were found is gone. An empty parking lot stands in its place. Heartbreakers shut down and today is known as centerfolds, though the building's main structure remains similar. In 2003, on what would have been Robin's 35th birthday, her family held a memorial tribute to her. Mary explained, quote, I need to do this for Robin. We're going to acknowledge her loss, then celebrate her life, however short. She had a great big heart, end quote. In 2018, Robert Trevisano passed away at the age of 58. In his obituary, Robin is listed as his late wife. In 1997, when discussing her disappearance, Robert expressed how devastated he was, noting that he still loved Robin, but understood they needed to be apart. It appears as though he never truly let go, as it's further noted that after Robin's passing, he chose to focus primarily on raising their three boys, who today are adults. In 2019, the newly formed cold case unit of the Monmouth County Prosecutor's Office began reinvestigating Robin's case. Megan Doyle, assistant prosecutor, told the Asbury Park Press that while they hadn't developed anything new, they were hoping to submit evidence for testing since there have been so many advances in DNA technology though she would not specify what evidence would be tested. She also noted that while many years had passed, there were two or three persons of interest, though she did not name them. As it stands, there have been no further updates on the investigation or any tests which may have been conducted. When last seen, Robin Trevisano was described as being a Caucasian female with some African ancestry standing 5 feet 2 inches tall and weighing approximately 105 pounds. Robin has brown hair and hazel eyes. She has a scar on her right eyelid. Her ears are pierced and she sometimes wears glasses. At least two of her teeth are capped and she was wearing press-on nails the night she vanished. It's known that Robin was wearing a waist-length brown coat later found in the woods and a leather hair barrette with a wooden pin, in addition to a Cartier watch. Robin was 28 years old in 1997, and if alive today, she would be turning 53 this summer. She was last seen exiting Heartbreaker's Go-Go Bar at 705 Route 35 South, Neptune City, New Jersey. For nearly two and a half decades, the mystery of Robin's fate has haunted her family. While the investigation has never managed to pick up steam, her family has hoped against the grain that someday Robin would be found and they might be able to give her a proper burial. Her sons, just boys when she vanished, are adults now who can't help but wonder what became of the mother they only got to know for a few short years. Mary is now 80 years old and has long since let go of the dream that one day Robin would just come walking back in the door or be found alive out there somewhere. She can only now hope that justice will be delivered somehow, some way, but that will never put an end to her nightmare. In 2019, she spoke with the Asbury Park Press and explained, quote, She missed everything. She missed being a mother. She missed her kids graduating. She missed everything. At least we could have got her and given her a proper funeral. We spoke about her as often as we could, and I had a memorial service for her to celebrate her life, because that's all I could do. The disappearance of Robin Trevisano is a truly mystifying case. Oftentimes, when we look at missing persons, we don't have much, if any, information about who they were last seen with or where they may have been going. There's plenty of cases where someone goes home and vanishes or gets picked up by an unknown person that no one gets a look at and never makes it home. In Robin's case, we have a really detailed description and composite drawing of the last person she was seen with. Not only that, but she didn't run into this guy on a street somewhere. She met him in a crowded bar in front of a ton of witnesses, and yet, 24 years later, 
not a single person has been able to provide his actual name. While we can't know for certain where Robin was taken that night, there's a lot of people who believe she did actually make it to Delilah's den, where her jacket and purse were found in the woods behind the parking lot. Others have argued that she never got there, and maybe her abductor returned later, putting the items there to cause confusion. The truth is, we can't know for sure. There's a lot of different scenarios that are possible. In fact, when it comes to this case, for as little coverage as it has received, there's actually several different theories that have been developed over the years. Before we jump into those, though, I want to address a couple of details that I know leave me feeling a bit confused. One of the first things about this case that stands out to me is the fact that when Robin's jacket and purse were found, there were still $500 inside. Had the items been placed there by her killer rather than left by Robin either during a struggle or under some other circumstances, I think it's strange that the money is still there. If someone did do something to her in that area, why not take the money? Was it some kind of a way to throw things off or to make it clear that this wasn't about money but something else? Was it an oversight or was her attacker in a rush because of people going in and out of the parking lot? Is it possible both items were there for the four months it took to find them and no one had noticed? It's hard to know one way or the other, but perhaps that could have been the point. Add more questions to a case that's already confusing and lacking solid leads, and you can make the whole investigation more chaotic. Another detail which bothers me has to do with the money, but in a different way. Robin had $500 cash on her that night at least. She goes to Heartbreakers, has a few drinks, and needs a ride to Delilah's den. Why go around asking people for a ride when she could have easily afforded to call a cab? Sure, maybe she didn't want to spend the money, but in a situation where it's spending money or taking a ride with a complete stranger, it doesn't seem like a complicated choice. One last thing I'd like to address is Robin's state of mind at the time she left the bar. Multiple people referred to her as being visibly intoxicated. While there's no available information to tell us how much she drank that night, the only reference we actually have is that she had at least one shot of tequila, there's a part of me that wonders if something else could have been involved. Being in the bar that night, it's possible someone could have put something in her drink. We also know from her mother that in the weeks leading up to her disappearance, she'd been drinking more than usual, which could suggest substance abuse as a coping mechanism. It's not entirely impossible that she could have chosen to take something that night to get away from the stress and drama to just feel good for a little while. There's nothing documented to show that she had any kind of history with drugs or any substances outside of alcohol, but people do extreme things when they're under a lot of pressure and feeling overwhelmed. Now, if we turn our attention towards the aftermath, Robin's disappearance, there's a handful of theories that have been suggested over the years. Many people believe the man she left the bar with that night may be the one who ultimately could have killed her. Others think it's possible the man gave her a ride to the next bar, dropped her in the parking lot, and left, at which time she could have been attacked by someone in the area, maybe even someone leaving the bar. Still yet again, some believe her boyfriend could have been involved in some way, while others look to more extreme examples, wondering if perhaps Robin could have been the victim of a serial killer maybe even one who has been known to have been active in the area where she disappeared. I'm going to begin with the serial killer, mostly because while interesting, I consider this the thinnest theory in this case. We're not talking about any random serial killer, but specifically the Long Island serial killer. The Long Island serial killer is believed to have been active as early as 1996, and at least two of his victims have connections to New Jersey. Most interestingly would be Valerie Mack, whose partial remains were discovered on November 19, 2000. I suppose what makes the connection interesting is that family and friends last saw Mack in the spring of 2000 in the area of Port Republic, approximately 20 miles north of where Robin lived. For a lot of people, it's about geography, with Robin disappearing just 70 miles from the Gilgo Beach area. I don't necessarily believe that's enough to make a connection, but it's surely something that piques the interest. Frankly, the Long Island serial killer is a case which is far too vast for me to properly address in the analysis of this theory outside of saying that 
While it's a possibility, I haven't seen much to readily make that assumption. Having grown up on Long Island and having lived not far from where some of the victims were found, including having spent a lot of time hanging out with friends within a half mile of one particular location, I assure you that I'll address the Long Island serial killer in long form at some point. I think it's important to mention that there were quite a few serial killers active in the tri-state area during the late 1990s, so to narrow it down to Long Island would be a complicated matter. Beyond that, there's the fact that Robin has never been found, and while there may be other victims of the Long Island serial killer that have yet to be located, I just don't think there's enough to form any kind of a connection. No investigators have ever considered Robin to be one of his victims. There seems to be this interesting phenomena among some members of the true crime community, where they want to broaden the scope of a known killer's victims. I see it happen a lot, and I'm not sure I fully understand it. For some people, they truly believe in the possibility. I think for others, it's just an easy answer to a complicated question. It's kind of like how I get at least 10 emails a week telling me how Israel Keys is likely responsible for every disappearance I've ever covered on this show. Moving away from the Long Island serial killer, we'll next take a look at Robin's boyfriend. Unfortunately, we don't have a lot to work with here. We don't even have his name. All we really know is that he was a married lawyer who must have made a good salary as he had no problem supporting Robin financially. I have to believe investigators dug into this guy's life and looked at every possible angle to see if he could have been involved. We know they argued that night, we know Robin was angry when she left, and she went immediately to Heartbreakers, which I feel like was something she did on purpose to piss him off. He wasn't going to leave his wife. So, why should she adhere to any commitment she'd made? Of course, she could have just been looking for a few friendly faces to take her mind off things. We will likely never know for sure one way or the other. But I suppose the issue becomes how the boyfriend could have been involved and why. Some people have suggested that financially supporting Robin was less about helping her and more about control. When people who have a desire for control lose that grip, they might act out violently. However, I find it hard to imagine that Robin was the first or perhaps only woman he was seeing outside of his marriage at the time. I tend to agree with Mary that he would have had a replacement lined up pretty quickly if he didn't already have one. It seems clear that whatever was going on, while Robin may have felt strong emotions for this man, he wasn't very invested. Also, having an argument about not leaving your wife, which is something they discussed before, doesn't seem like a reason to commit murder. Now, maybe she could have threatened to tell his wife and that could have set something off, but logistically, things become complicated. With Robin leaving the bar that night with the unidentified stranger, I'm not really sure how the boyfriend would have been able to find her to do anything to her in the first place. Even if he knew she had gone to Heartbreakers, would he have known where she was off to next? Also, would he have left her coat and purse in the woods behind Delilah's den? open to the possibility that they might find evidence of his presence there when he easily could have just disposed of it in the same place he would have taken Robin. I understand why this is a theory. You've got to look at the boyfriend, especially under these circumstances. The problem is, there's never been any evidence to link him to the crime, and outside of acknowledging that they spoke to him, police have never mentioned him again. I also think it's worth noting that Robin's family knows his identity, and not only have they never shared it, they've never even speculated about his possible involvement. Turning now towards the mystery man, this long-haired, bright-smiled, well-dressed and tan guy who comes out of nowhere to offer Robin a ride over to Delilah's. This is an aspect of the case that just makes no sense to me. Robin was a smart woman who had danced at the bar for a few years. Surely she was aware of the dangers of leaving the bar with a random guy, especially one who, on a cold, icy night, is volunteering to drive her to another club 25 minutes away. I don't care how he dressed or what he looked like, that should have been setting off alarm bells. Now, maybe, in her inebriated state, Robin wasn't thinking clearly. Or, there's the possibility that while no one in the bar knew this guy, maybe she did.
This hasn't been explored too deeply, but I've never been totally convinced that Robin couldn't have known this guy from somewhere. It just doesn't connect to me that she'd leave with a random stranger when, as I noted earlier, she could have taken a cab. Mary felt that someone at the bar knew this guy, and while everyone said they didn't, you have to wonder if it's possible. Multiple people were able to provide a very detailed description, yet no one got his name, no one had a conversation with him. It's an interesting area of the case that, again, doesn't connect for me. It just feels like there's a piece of the puzzle missing. Now, if this is the man who was responsible for Robin's disappearance, I suppose it comes down to a question of how and why. Sure, he could just be a sick killer who goes to bars to pick up potential victims, but wouldn't you imagine he'd try to blend in? Why dress up so much to go to a place that I would frankly describe as a dive? Maybe it was a matter of disarming a potential victim, but it's also going to draw a lot of attention. It just doesn't seem like a very smart plan to purposefully stick out when you're planning to commit a murder. There's also the fact that while we know Robin walked out of the bar with him, no one actually saw her get into his vehicle or saw his vehicle at all. I don't think it's impossible that Robin could have stepped outside, saw someone she actually knew, and went with them. Whether this guy was her killer or a red herring is really hard to say. What really confuses me is the jacket and the purse being found later. Is it possible this guy actually did drive her to Delilah's and either attacked her when they got there or maybe dropped her off and drove away having never done anything? Looking at it from the first perspective, maybe it was a matter of isolating her driving her to the back of the parking lot near the wooded area. Maybe no one would have noticed if a struggle began in the car. Also, I think it's probably unlikely that people don't engage in certain illicit activities in the parking lots of these types of establishments, which could cause people walking through the parking lot to have a tendency to not pay attention to what's going on in a parked car. I've always wondered if perhaps Robin's coat and purse were found in the woods, because in a desperate attempt to flee, she ran into the woods. Maybe this guy grabs her by the wrist, so she wriggles out of her coat, dropping her purse in the process. She tries to escape, but he catches up, and before she knows it, she's unconscious or worse, and he's pulling her back towards his car or van or truck. We have no way of knowing what he was driving. I 100% believe this could be her killer the person police have been searching for all this time. But sadly, after 24 years, no one's been able to identify him, which says to me either he's not from the area, or he didn't stick around long afterwards, or he simply never returned to that part of New Jersey. Based on the location, he easily could have been from New York or Pennsylvania. Hell, Newark Airport is just 20 miles north of Delilah, so there's even a possibility that he was in town for a night or two and was gone by the next morning. Finally, we have to look at the possibility that almost anyone could have been involved. Imagine the scenario where this unidentified guy drops Robin off in the parking lot and drives away. Between where she's dropped and the entrance to the club, she could have run into someone she knew, someone who was looking for trouble someone who recognized her as a former go-go dancer, almost anyone. Maybe a couple of guys getting thrown out of the club or just leaving after running out of cash. Someone who just arrived and saw an easy target in a visibly intoxicated woman stumbling across the pavement. It's a horrible thing to consider, but there's a lot of dark possibilities here. Maybe Robin does somehow end up in that woods, either being chased or lured, Maybe the items that are left at the time sit exposed to the elements for four months before anyone notices. Maybe Robin never got to the club that night, and her killer later dropped the jacket and purse there to throw the investigation off, or to cast suspicion in a different direction. We don't know exactly who Robin was planning to visit at Delilah's that night. I imagine police do, and I'd sure like to know a little bit more about him. What was his relationship with Robin? whether or not he knew she was coming that night. That really is the thing with this case. For the very few answers we have about anything, there's a hundred more questions for which we simply have no idea. All we really know at the end of the day is once Robin walked out of Heartbreakers, 
Almost anything could have happened, which led to the 28-year-old mother of three never making it home. It's been 24 years since Robin Trevisano vanished. Over all this time, almost nothing has been determined. Police haven't had much to say, and they haven't had much to work with. While it's hopeful to know that the cold case unit was digging back into the case in 2019, it seems that more than a year later, nothing further has been discovered. There's no new leads, no new tips, and no new evidence. Robin's case, sadly, was growing cold by the time investigators were called, and whoever was responsible had more than 36 hours to get away. I can't imagine what it's been like for her family. I can't imagine the thoughts and questions that must come rushing into them when they think about it. The unknowing, the grief, the loss, and the pain. Someone somewhere does have the answers. Someone knows the truth. And more than likely, more than one person holds the keys to this mystery. Unfortunately, unless someone comes forward with new information, Investigators are able to find new evidence, possibly through further testing with advanced DNA technology, or Robin herself is found. This case will remain open, unsolved, and very cold. If you're interested in learning more about the disappearance of Robin Trevisano, Unfortunately, there's not much available outside of archival news articles. The police have been very quiet about their investigation, and the Monmouth County Prosecutor's Office hasn't said much either. If you have any information about the disappearance of Robin Trevisano, please contact the Monmouth County Prosecutor's Office Major Crimes Unit at 732-431-7012 or 1-800-533-7443. You can also contact the Neptune Township Police Department at 732-988-8000. If you wish to remain anonymous, you can contact the Monmouth County Crime Stoppers Confidential Tip Line by calling 1-800-671-4400. You can also text the word Monmouth plus your tip to 274-637. Or you can email a tip via the website at monmouthcountycrimestoppers.com. Monmouth County Crime Stoppers will pay up to $5,000 for information leading to the arrest of criminals and fugitives. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod. Message me on Instagram at Trace Evidence Pod, email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com, or comment in the Facebook group. Trace Evidence would not be possible without the support of amazing listeners like you. Now I'd like to take a moment to thank our amazing Patreon producers Alicia Lorraine, Brittany Bivens, Brian Kemmerling, Christine Greco, Krista Colvin, Dorothy, Denise Dingsdale, Diane Dyson, Eamon Brady, James, Jennifer Winkler, Joni Berkwitz, Kevin Bonham, Marla Wright, Melissa Breckeisen, Michael Draves, Nick Mohar Schurz, Roberta Jansen, Quinn McBreen, Sarah Levenin, Sarah Mascaritolo, Travis Sepsko, Stephanie Joyner, Stephanie Eve, Tom Archer, Tom Radford, and Tracy Woods. Your contributions to Trace Evidence are invaluable, and your support of the show is both appreciated and humbling. If you're interested in supporting Trace Evidence, getting cool merch, and having access to commercial-free episodes, please visit patreon.com slash trace evidence. That concludes this episode of Trace Evidence. I want to thank you for listening, and I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence. Trace Evidence.